Good morning, I'm Sylvia, a member of the Board of Trustees of Tahoma UU Congregation. As we begin our gathering, I respectfully acknowledge that I speak to you today from Occupy Puyallup ancestral land. I, respect, I pay respect to elders past and present and extend the respect to their descendants and all indigenous people. We welcome all who are joining us with the longing for community, the hope for peace, and those who are seeking justice. We are a diverse congregation, which encourages each one who comes through our doors to find their own truth and belief. We invite all to join us in search for meaning and community, guided by reason, respect for each other, and by love. The wonderful thing about this virtual platform is that we have the opportunity to welcome guests outside of our traditional geographic area. So a special welcome to our new friends and our returning friends from near and far away. I invite you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Links to the video version of this service will be posted there this week as well on our website. You can find all of our program announcements this week in our e-news and listed on our church calendar. And here are some of the highlights this week. After service today at 1130, children and their parents are invited to the Kids Chapel with Nancy Slocum, Director of our Religious Exploration for Children and Youth. Today at noon, congregants are invited to join members of our sabbatical committee for a discussion about Reverend Linda's upcoming sabbatical time. During the summer months of Reverend Linda's sabbatical, we'll be a part of a worship collaborative with online, online worship services alongside Saltwater UU Church in Des Moines and North Lake UU Church in Kirkland. And we'll have worship leadership participation from each congregation. While we work together reopening at, while we work together reopening our building for worship service and programs, we sincerely hope that it will be in this fall. We've updated our request to all groups to meet with awareness of the recommendations from the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department and the Washington State Department of Health. Links for this can be found in the e-news and on our website. We've also posted the links for you in our chat. Information updates frequently, so please continue to consult with these two agencies as, your plan, as you plan your gatherings. On your screen, you will see a lovely photo of the Gandar Rood family, Rochelle, Eli, and Olive. And we've shared this, we've shared, and we're sharing this to remind you to send us your photos with flowers or plants for a video we've created for the flower service on Sunday, June 6th. Please send your photos by Wednesday, June 2nd, and you can find the email address for this in the chat. Links for all of our pro programs can be found in the weekly e-news or via the events on our church calendar. Thank you for your ongoing financial support to our congregation that makes all of this possible. These programs are staff who creates and facilitates the programs and the connection that we make through our congregation. Now let us prepare together in worship. Good morning, friends. It's good to be together today. Let us enter into this time together with spacious intentions. The wide, buzzing, beautiful world calls to us with too many voices sometimes. Concerns, and confusion reign as the hope of something like normal begins to appear in our lives. These months of isolation, of distance, of fear have taken their toll. So let us come together with spacious intentions, not to seek the perfect, but rather to be open to the possible, not to long for what was, rather open to what gifts may arrive in new form. 
to be open to discovery, even amidst, in the midst of confusion and exhaustion and fear. Let us come together with spacious intentions and with the trust that we will find what comes next and that it will be enough and that it will be that we will be enough to make whatever comes worthy and beautiful. Indeed, it is good to be together this morning. As Nancy lights our chalice, please join me in the uh, chalice lighting reading. We light this chalice in deep respect for the myster mystery and holiness of life in honor and gratitude for those who have gone before, with love and compassion for those who dwell among us, and with hope and faith for the generations to come. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nancy Slocum, and I am the Director of Religious Exploration here at Tahoma Unitarian Universalist Congregation. It is so good to be with all of you this morning. This is our time for all ages, so I invite kids to come close to the computers or iPads or whatever device you're on for our time for all ages. So uh, today, the theme of today's service is keep breathing, keep breathing. And it got me thinking about how, like, we keep breathing all the time, whether we think about it or not, right? We just, our bodies keep breathing. I don't think about my breath going in and out very much, um, unless, like, I'm hiking and I'm going up a steep hill, and then I become very aware of my breath as I start <sighs> having to get lots of oxygen in to help me get up the hill. And maybe you notice that if you're out hiking or playing soccer or playing tag or just running around with your friends, you might notice that your breathing gets harder and you pay attention to it a little bit. But we can also use our breath to help us in other ways. We can use our breath to help us feel better. Maybe when we're feeling upset or worried or angry, you may notice when you're worried or angry, feeling upset that your, whole, your body can get tense. All your muscles can get tight. I know sometimes if I'm really stressed, I really feel it in the muscles in the back of my neck. And uh, there's a way we can use breathing to help us relax and to let go of some of those intense, hard feelings that we're having. We can do this by, by doing something called meditation. And maybe you've done some meditation. And I have a couple of meditation techniques to teach you this morning. So you, these are things that you can try at home later on. You might want to do them on a regular basis or on times when you're feeling really kind of upset or stressed out about something, or you're worrying about something. Meditation can help your body relax and can help your mind relax. So the first one, I want you to get kind of in a comfortable position. You can be sitting up to do this or if you wanted to lie back somewhere and do it, that's fine too. And in this, we're gonna have to tense up our muscles. Have you ever, has anyone ever told you to like make a muscle? You can't really see it in my arm here, but when you, you tighten the muscle in your arm and the muscle bulges up, or if you make a fist, you can, you can make a light fist or you can make a tight fist. Those are times when we're tightening up our muscles. So we're gonna be doing that as part of this meditation practice. Okay, so first, we're going to start with what we call cleansing breaths, where we just do a deep breath in through our nose and out through your mouth. And practice this with me. We're going to do three cleansing breaths, and then I'll talk you through the meditation. So in through the nose and out through the mouth. Again, another cleansing breath in through the nose, out through the mouth. One more. And now start with one foot, and I want you to practice tensing up that muscle. So you're going to tighten that muscle, and you're going to hold it tight while you take a couple of breaths. So tighten that, like making a fist with your foot, right? Tighten up your foot, and then breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. One more breath in, and one more breath out. And as you let that breath out, let that muscle relax in your foot. We're going to do the same thing with the other foot. 
Tighten up that muscle and breathe in and out. Breathe in it tight, breathe in, and then let the muscle go as you breathe out. Now move back to the other leg and do your calf and your ankle. The calf is the muscle uh, behind your knee, down below the knee. So breathe in, get that muscle tight, breathe out, breathe in. And as you breathe out, relax that muscle. Now do the other ankle and calf. Breathe in, in as you tighten it up as tight as you can make it, and then breathe out. Breathe in and let it go as you breathe out and just let that muscle relax. The thighs, the thighs are above your knees, those big muscles above your knees. So same thing, tighten one side, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out and letting go of that muscle. I'm not gonna go through the whole body. We don't really have time for that today, but you do the next thigh, and then you do your, all your feet and legs together, just once, tightening it all, and then letting that go after a couple breaths. And then you do your hips, and then your bottom, and then your belly, and then the whole body from the tummy down. And then you do your chest and your heart, and then one arm, and then the other arm. Again, each time breathing in and out, in and then release those muscles each time. And then for the last one, just tighten up your whole body. Breathing in and out, in and relax. This is something you can practice at home. Maybe it's something you and your brothers or sisters and your, the grown-ups in your life might do on a regular basis, or it could just be doing something, doing it sometime when you're feeling kind of stressed and worried. Maybe you're a little anxious because of things that are going on at school or because you had a problem with a friend or whatever, or just kind of feel intense. You, see, you can use this. I have one other quick one to do this, and this is a quick one that you can kind of do anytime. I like this one because it's pretty quick. So think of your belly as a balloon, okay? Think of it as a big balloon in your favorite color balloon, whatever that is. I think today I'm going to think of mine as being a big red balloon. And you're going to start with two cleansing breaths again, breathing in, breathe out, breathe in through the nose. Breathe out. Now when you breathe in, think about inflating that balloon. Make your tummy as big as you can make it. Fill it up with air. Great big belly and breathe it out, keeping your balloon inflated. And then breathe in one more time and let it go, keeping that big balloon inflated. And this next time, breathe in. And when you breathe out, let the balloon go like you released a balloon that's not tied and have it go. <laughs> Let's do that again. Breathe in and inflate your balloon. Breathe out. Keeping that balloon big. Again, breathe in and keep that balloon big and breathe out. Now we're going to breathe in. And as you let that balloon deflate, make the noise and wiggle your arms. Ready? Go. <laughs> That's a quick, easy one to do. And it gets rid of some of the stress and the tension. And you might find that it helps you get rid of some of those tough feelings that you might be having, whether it's stress or anger or even sadness. It might help with that. So as we talk about keep, keep breathing, here are some new ways that you can breathe at home. I will finish up with our, uh, the words that we use to sing kids out of the sanctuary when we're here in church. And those are, we hold you in our love as you go, as you go. May your heart be at peace as you go. To nurture the spark of your precious life, we hold you in our love as you go. Take good care, everyone. Thanks. Well, everyone, keep, keep breathing, yes. But let's think about something else that we might do naturally or might be worth a little moment of intention.
what can we do to turn our financial resources into financial gifts to support the work of this congregation? So thanks for considering support um, for the, the work of this church in during these unprecedented times. Um, follow the link on the slide or in the chat. Um, you can also see instructions how to text your donation to, to the um, to contribute to the to the work of this church. Tire, you know, the members and staff tirelessly keep this congregation connected. And as we've learned in new and dynamic ways. So every little bit helps. What and while we are physically apart, our gifts are stronger together. So please do we can help. And now I invite you to with me dedicate our offerings. We dedicate ourselves and our offering to the work of this congregation, weaving a tapestry of love we call community, both within and beyond these walls. Let's carry on uh, with the meditation that Nancy invited us into now that we've had our big cleansing breaths. Uh, I wanna share with you a poem that I've shared before called Self-Compassion by James Cruz. And uh, James offers in the end of this, uh, in this poem, a, a, a practice of setting our hand or both of our hands onto our chest. Um, and so I'll, I'll invite you to do that uh, as we move into our time of stillness, or if it feels comfortable to you as you get ready for a time of reflection and quiet or prayer. Um, to lean back, close your eyes and set one hand or both on your heart. Self-compassion by James Cruz. My friend and I snickered the first time we heard the meditation teacher, a grown man, call himself Honey, with a hand placed over his heart to illustrate how we too might become more gentle with ourselves and our runaway minds. It's been years since we sat with legs twisted on cushions, holding back our laughter. And today I found myself crouched on the floor again, not meditating exactly, just agreeing to be still, saying honey to myself each time I thought about my husband splayed on the couch with aching joints and fever from a tick bite. What if he never gets better? or considered the mess of the next election, or remembered in just a few more minutes, I'd have to climb down into the cellar and empty the bucket I left beneath a leaky pipe that can't be fixed until next week. How long do any of us really have before the body begins to break down and empty its mysteries into the air? Oh, honey. I said, for once without a trace of irony or blush of shame, the touch of my own hand on my chest like that of a stranger, oddly comforting in spite of the facts. Let us breathe together and on our hearts, perhaps murmuring, oh honey, to ourselves. So may it be. Amen. For our reading this morning, we have an excerpt from a story in the New York Times by Sarah Lyle. We have all hit a wall confronting late stage pandemic burnout with everything from edibles to exodus. I feel fried, said Aaron H., a social media and event coordinator at a Midwestern university whose work once inspired and excited her, but currently seems like an unpleasant cocktail of boredom, dread, and exhaustion. She asked that her last name not be used so as not to upset her employers. Things take longer to get done, she said, in part because she doesn't want to do them. 
I'm out of ideas and have zero motivation to even get to a point where I feel inspired, she wrote, responding to a request by the New York Times for people to describe their work-related challenges in, in month 13 of the pandemic. Every time my inbox dings, I feel a pang of dread. None of that is, is surprising, said Margaret Werenberg, an expert on anxiety and the author of the book, Pandemic Anxiety, Fear, Stress and Loss in Traumatic, Traumatic Times. A year of uncertainty, of being whipsawed between anxiety and depression, of seeing expert predictions wither away and goalposts shift has left many people feeling that they are existing in a kind of fog, the world shaded in gray. When people are under a long period of chronic, unpredictable stress, they develop behavioral anhedonia, Dr. Werenberg said, meaning the loss of the ability to take pleasure in their activities. And so they get lethargic, they show a lack of interest, and Obviously, that plays a huge role in productivity. It's not just productivity, of course. It's much more than that. And we'll talk more about what it has been like these last months. I wonder how many of you identify with that description that Scott just shared. Back on Facebook, <clears throat> a couple of days ago, I spotted a single frame comic titled The Weirdest Thing About Humans. It's from Saturday Morning Breakfast Theater, the serial, if you're, if you're familiar with that, uh, uh, that comic. There's a picture of a guy walking down the street and there's a thought bubble above his head. And it reads, I can't tell if the whole world is careening toward imminent uh, apoc apocalypse or if I'm just hungry and tired. The friend who posted it commented, why not both? It's a pretty good summation, I think, of how it has been for us the last 15, 16 months that we've been living our way through the pandemic. Don't you think? Don't you think? How are you doing out there? Now that we're some, uh, now that there's something closer to normal that is becoming possible for us, how are you doing with that? For me, it's not much better yet. The consistent fogginess that I experience, the exhaustion that seems to be there no matter how much sleep I get, and a hesitancy still, a hesitancy to be in physical contact with people who aren't in my household, that whole thing. I'm not sure I'm doing better yet. As our reading suggested this morning, it's not just me and it's not just you. In the article, the authors explained that the New York Times invited people to tell them how they've fared through the pandemic. They are, and we are, burned out, toasted, fried. They write, as Scott said, a year of uncertainty, of being whipsawed between anxiety and depression, of seeing expert predictions wither away and the goalpost shift has left many people feeling that they are existing in a kind of fog, a world shaded in gray. Are you feeling that, my friends? The podcast On Being with Krista Tippett recently hosted Dr. Christine Runyon, Runyon, a clinical psychologist and mindfulness coach whose practice focuses on healthcare workers. I expect she has had one heck of a busy year this year. In their conversation that they call what's happening to our nervous system, uh, Runyon talks about what's going on in us and why it is we're all exhausted. When I began listening to the podcast recommended by several friends, I was drawn back to a, the phrase from a Mary, po Mary Oliver poem that um, Bob shared with us two weeks ago, the poem Wild Geese. In it, Oliver reminds us that we don't have to be good or to repent on our knees. She says, you only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. 
You only have to let the soft animal that is your body love what it loves. It's that description of us, us human beings, that soft animal of our body that resonates with me. That soft animal that we inhabit, it's miraculous. And that deeply animal part of us, that most ancient part of our brains, senses danger before conscious thought and reacts. It makes our hearts beat faster, it raises our blood pressure, and it floods us with hormones and neurotransmitters. When it experiences just the hint of danger, it prepares us to fight or to run like hell. Have you felt that during this time? That nervous system, I think, spotted the danger in March of last year, at least it did for me, and it has hardly had a moment to relax. We just have had to keep going and watching what was coming, watching to see what was going to happen next. The election perhaps gave us a bit of brief respite, but there's still a watchfulness inhabiting almost everyone I know. Perhaps it inhabits everyone right now. Fight or flight is the most familiar of our automatic unconscious responses to danger. And that's what the body is preparing us for um, without our willing it or wanting it necessarily. There's another uh, response that's less familiar to us, at least it was to me, and um, Dr. Runyon described it as the freeze response. Here's what she says about it. It's a state of apathy, of detachment, of even disembodied or dissociative and numbing. And that is a state of physiological high arousal. Do you get that? detachment, apathy, disembodied or disassociative, numbing. It's a state of high physical, physiological arousal. Don't be fooled, she's saying. It's not that you aren't working at keeping yourself safe. Your body is working hard if you are in a place of numbness. It is working hard. Experiencing depression or ap apathy or feeling numb is indeed hard work, as hard as preparing for fighting off whatever danger is approaching. What this tells me, what I know, is that this year and a few months has been hard. Hard on our bodies, hard on our spirits, hard on our souls. And here's another view into why we're feeling how we're feeling. The trauma that we've experienced during this pandemic resonates back to previous traumas in our lives. Other times when we didn't feel like we were safe, when there was danger all around us. In a, um, in a video pre uh, presentation that my colleagues uh, in the central uh, Midwest um, did for congregations considering or looking at how they're going to reopen. Um, my colleague, Sunshine Wolf, reflected upon the trauma of the pandemic time. So I invite you now to uh, just pause and listen to what he has to say. And so you want to be able to prepare your community, not just for um, what it means to do the practical of coming back, but what it means to care for your entire community as it is recovering from a traumatic experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's not going to be instantly over. And we already know this is going to be a slow process as folks are getting vaccinated. And even after everyone's been vaccinated, for some of our folks, it still won't be safe for them to come out because of how immune compromised or other things they're dealing with. 
probably won't matter how many people are vaccinated, they still may not be able to leave their homes. And so we're dealing with people in a lot of stages of engagement and where they can be in their world. Um, folks will start to feel tired, more depressed, more exhausted. And I wanna say, when I say folks, I mean you. Not just the people you serve, but you the leaders. Your ministers, your religious educators, your board presidents, your RE teachers, your everybody who's doing any kind of leadership in your church are going through these things too. And so you want to do the things that help care for people. Allow them to enter slowly and to resist that urgency that may come as a result of wanting to get back to things as normal. Um, it's really common for folks after a traumatic experience to not want to talk about it anymore. Um, even a slight mention of COVID might get some folks a little reactive. And that's where ritual helps you, those kinds of things. There's going to be this kind of, I, I like the language, I didn't create this, but somebody put it in the document, trauma residue. There's going to be some residual from this experience for a long time. And so it's important to be able to keep that present um, I often work with congregations and um, they'll say after a year, well, why do we still have to keep talking about this? And it's because humans don't get over things quickly. It takes us years, particularly communities. It can take five to 10 years of intentional effort to help a community do a significant amount of healing. So imagine that you're going to be doing some of this work, not for the next six months or a year, but probably the next five to 10 years of helping your congregation kind of reassess. That may sound anxiety producing, but here's the other thing. It gives you lots of room to be nimble, to think about inclusion, to focus on your mission. You don't have to solve it all. And when you take away that time pressure, it gives everybody that emotional space to kind of recover and be in community. Um, Are you feeling some of that, my friends? Do you recognize yourself in some of Sunshine's description? Never doubt that your body is tired, your nervous system is exhausted. You've come through and are going through a traumatic time that will take much longer to heal than you might imagine. And so I wanna to say to you, keep breathing. Dr. Runyon recommends that we take time to exhale long and full. Nancy and I have not had, did not have a conversation about what I was doing in the sermon today. So her um, leading in, uh, her lead into our, our time together um, was masterful and um, prescient. She uh, foresaw what I would, uh, some of the things that I was going to be talking about, even without having had a conversation with me about it. One of the things Dr. Runyon says is that when we exhale, when we exhale long and full, it activates that part of our nervous system that calms us. Our bodies are miraculous things, and we can use those miracles to help us as we continue to find out what this new world we're moving toward is. It is essential to keep grounding yourself, literally, I mean grounding yourself, finding your feet on the floor, finding your feet on the ground, on, on the earth as you stand outside, pressing your feet down and feeling your connection down through the floor and the concrete, down to, to um, to heart rock, I mean, all the way down, to feel that groundedness. You can also just ground into where you are, feel, feel your, your body just sink down, feel your strong foundation that your hips offer to you. Doing this is a way of making your body just feel safe just feel safe and it works. Doing this kind of thing works. Um, Dr. Runyon uh, 
gave us an opportunity in the in the podcast cast, and we'll put this um, on our Facebook page and also on our website. A link to that what the um, the podcast if you'd like to listen to the whole thing yourself. But she gave us she gives a, a an example of the influence our body has and and how it can really help us, how it can really change things. So she says, just just pausing for a moment and think about cutting into a bright yellow orange and then taking a taste of the juice. Now, I don't know about you, but I've listened to this podcast a couple of times and I've thought of this a couple of times, actually a lot of times because it's just so remarkable to me and my mouth just filled with saliva. It just watered every single time. I said it to my husband this morning and I watched him swallow. Um, I'm wondering if you had that feeling as well. It is possible for us using some of these techniques to elicit a healing response, just as it's possible to elicit that mouth watering when you think of a bright yellow lemon that you've cut into. God, there it goes again. Our deep breathing, our grounding of ourselves, and that self-compassion that James Cruz suggests, that simple act of putting your hand over your heart and saying, oh, honey, to yourself. All of this will help get us through. All of this will help to calm that nervous system to allow us a greater sense of spaciousness, to help us find what's next and make it beautiful. We live in extraordinary times. Nothing like this has happened in our lifetimes, even for the long, most long lived among us. The teachings around how our soft animal bodies respond in times like these and the teachings of spiritual traditions around the world all offer us ways to make these times easier as we look to what we will discover next. So we're going to move into the time for setting an intention and this week we're going to take a little more time than we usually do. So I would invite you first to Take a moment to ground yourself and settle into your seat. Put both feet on the floor and feel that connection. Close your eyes if you wish. And place one hand, both hands on your chest over your heart and take some of those cleansing breaths that Nancy was suggesting, breathing in through your nose and then a long, slow exhale. Breathing in and out and deepen into that breath. And as you pause and find your intention for this week, if there's something that you wish to carry from our time together out into the rest of your life. Even if it's just that you need to say softly to yourself, perhaps, oh honey, maybe it's, I am safe. Perhaps I am loved. My friends, let us pause and ground and breathe together. Our closing words are by Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard and the path is never clear and the stakes are very high. Take courage for deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. So may it be, amen and blessed be.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now for our closing blessing song, um, we'll hear our own Kat Gilnoski. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live.